Welcome to Platforms, the life-lifting news program for women. Now, here's your host, Siobhan Palmer. Hey, welcome back everybody to Platforms, a life-lifting news program for women. We're wrapping up our conversation today with Dr. Todd Dewey, a cardiac thoracic surgeon at Medical City Dallas. Dr. Dewey, let's talk, you've had a fabulous career. I know you did a lot of uh, your studying up in the New York area, and rumor has that you um, have a friend named Dr. Mehmet Oz, is that correct? That is correct. I, uh, when I finished my cardiac training at New York Hospital Cornell, I mm -hmm. went over to Columbia and spent a year uh, cool. doing transplants and uh, mechanical assist devices and, and at that time Mehmet was running the mechanical assist device program so mm -hmm. I worked with Mehmet very closely for a wow. year and uh, got to hang out with him right as uh, this was before he became big yeah. he, was, he was just a surgeon at that point he wasn't really big at that point but uh, Mehmet is an interesting guy he, mm -hmm. he's, he, uh, he's extremely bright uh, very intelligent mm -hmm. uh, very driven Mm -hmm. um, and it was just a just a pleasure to work with for a year. Yeah, very personal guy. I'm, I'm a little. Uh, he hasn't invited me on his show. I yet, know. So it's I, cool. I, I've got what's a little. Up, Dr. Yeah, what's up with that? <laughs> That's right. That's right. You know, we're just little people now, I That's guess. That's right. Talk to the hand. Right? Exactly. Um, do you have talk about personal mentors in your life? I'm sure you had many professional. What about personal mentors? Yeah, I, I really have. You know. Uh, Probably my father has been the biggest influence on myself. Mm -hmm. uh, my uh, my dad was a career military officer, really? and so uh, what we. Branch? Uh, he was in the Air Force. Air Force. Yeah. So he uh, he retired as a colonel. Uh, wow. And so we, uh, I was originally from Mississippi, but we ended up moving around quite a bit. I went to three different junior highs and mm -hmm. uh, a Military couple different grad. elementary schools. And so you, you learn to sort of be self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. uh, you learn to sort of, uh, you know, make your way in the world. And he was always very supportive mm -hmm. on whatever we wanted to do. Uh, but, uh, you know, you had to sort of stay within the standard. And, sure. you know, he had very high expectations. And, and so uh, it really created a sense of responsibility in both right. myself and my my two sisters and, and you know striving for perfection and trying to to do better every day and be the mm -hmm. be the best that we can be. Now, what do your sisters do? Are they in the medical field or not? No, one of my one of my sisters is a, uh, a uh, well, one's a pastor. They both live in Colorado, and really? the other one's just a housewife. So uh, yeah, they mm -hmm. uh, they have uh, families and uh, just uh, just enjoy life. Let's talk about the future of cardiology. I mean, technology seems to be changing every five minutes. Where do you see your field in the next say? 10 to 15 years. Is there ever going to be a time where people are going to be able to maintain lives well over the age, well we are now over the age of 100? Right. Well, you know, life uh, longevity is a, is, a, is a different thing. Most of the time with older people we're talking mm -hmm. about quality of life, not quantity Ab of life. Absolutely. And so what we really focus on, particularly in my field, is the fact that if we're going to operate on older people, we want to make sure that they can maintain autonomy and we can give them a quality of life. Mm -hmm. You know, the most common thing that I hear from older patients is I'm not afraid to die, but I don't want to end up in a nursing home. I don't want to be a, have a stroke and I don't want to end up on machines or right. be, you know, be a burden to my family. And so quality of life is much more important than quality of life uh, when you start talking about elderly people. But, you know, what I see for the future for our specialty is it's continuing to go along the track of, mm -hmm. you know, smaller access, catheter based type of yep. procedures you know uh, if it's a bake-off between surgery and a catheter the catheter will generally always win right uh, because people you know no matter who they are even mm -hmm. even physicians you know if, if the offer is a, a stent or a sternotomy mm -hmm. you know even cardiac surgeons will take the stent by and large yep. if, if it's you know the right uh, right indication and so you know in this country uh, bypass grafting has actually gone down 40 or 50 percent over the last couple of years is really? drug eluding stents and interventional ways uh, to repair uh, blocked arteries uh, have gotten better mm -hmm. and I think that's, that's actually a good thing for society because right. it's you know it's a faster procedure it's easier on the patients mm -hmm. uh, they do very well with a lot of that and, and the same thing is happening in our specialty with the transcatheter valves and other things sure. we're going towards more port access minimal access you know less invasive type procedures mm -hmm. and I think it benefits everybody I had the opportunity to meet Dr. Denton Cooley when I was at an event in Houston. That gentleman, I believe, it, he was obviously one of the pioneers in your field. Have you had an opportunity to meet that Dr. Cooley? I've actually met Dr. Cooley a couple of times. And uh, mm -hmm. two or three, two years ago, I was invited to give a, a lecture down at his meeting that he has, uh, wow. the Cooley Society meeting. And so got That's a chance cool. to spend some time with him. Just an unbelievable guy, mm -hmm. uh, really a, a, a pioneer in the, in the field of uh, cardiac surgery. And, right. You know, it's uh, he and DeBakey had sort of this rivalry going on yes. down in Houston, and yep. you know, Cooley would always say, uh, you know, he would never stop working until DeBakey retired, and so <laughs> and Cooley was still operating into his 80s. He would always say, "Gee, I wish that guy would just die or die, retire, so, so I, I could go, stop." That's right. I could go. Oh, 
golf yeah. Oh, he's actually a big tennis player. Is Still he? plays tennis. Yeah, he actually went to UT on a tennis scholarship, Good I think. And very great shape. The guy's, uh, guy's amazing. Millie Sharp, and he's still in his mid to late 80s. So. Well, you know, it's funny because I was sitting at the same table. It spoke volumes to me because they were having a very heavy lunch with, you know, red meat, mashed potatoes, and he was having, like, a vegetable plate. So mm -hmm. that really resonated. Yeah. Um, we have a few more minutes, but I just wanted to ask you, you're dealing with life and death on a weekly basis. So how is... How has what you do for a living impact you on a personal level in terms of how you view life and the value of life and, and things like that? Well, that's a good question. And, and you know, we, it's an interesting question to ask physicians because mm -hmm. we get a skewed view of the world yes. because everybody we come into contact on a professional basis is sick or has something right. wrong with them. And, and while it's still the minority of patients, it gives you pause to think that, you know, mm -hmm. Life can change on a dime for anybody. Uh, you know, you really need to take time and figure out what mm -hmm. are the important things in your life and what makes you happy. And, mm -hmm. and the things that we, we all think make, a ha make us happy, uh, money or wealth or power, it, it's really not important. You know, right. and the last thing you want to do is think that, you know, I climbed the ladder of success and found out it was leaning against the wrong wall. And so, Ooh, I like that. you know, you just, you, you got to cherish your, your time with your family and mm -hmm. your friends. Uh, because we see it on a daily basis. You could, right. you know, have a heart attack, you could be hit by a car, you know, uh, bad things can happen. And so you really sort of have to, you know, live each day to the fullest and, 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 and just be happy. Absolutely. Well, I, I couldn't close with a better comment than that. that. Um, Dr. Todd Dewey, it has been an absolute pleasure. Can you give our audience some information if they want to get more information about your group that you deal with? Or we can go to the Medical City Dallas website, obviously, to get more information. Absolutely. So our, our group is called CSANT Cardiac uh, Surgery Associates in North Texas. We Terrific. have a large group. It's about 40 cardiologists and about wow. 18 surgeons. Wow. Uh, have a website, CSANT, C-S-A-N-T dot com. Okay. And we can always be found through Medical City. One more thing, and I, I forgot to ask you this. So many people, the young residents going through medical school, they, they spend so many hours. What is your thought about these rotations where they're on call 18, 20 hours? And I'm sure you went through that as a young... Uh well, you know, it's interesting. You know, over the last couple of years, there's been a big push to decrease residency work hours. Right. When I went through, there were no residency work hours. So we, we, we worked about 120 hours a week or so. And 120 hours? Yeah. We were on call every other night. And, and uh, so, you know, the thing about it is, is medicine is a 24-hour business. Yeah. And, um, you know, even now I typically work about 80 hours a week. And so, you know, I, I think to a certain extent they have to work the workload to know what it's like that's going to be when they get out into practice yep. because there's no resident to spell them. You can't check off and, right. you know, you're, you're on call all the time it's for part your of the patients. Gig. It's part of the gig. And yeah. so I think in a sense that they lose some of that training and preparation mm -hmm. by that. Now, you know, the, the concern is that mistakes are being made right. by tired residents, but I, there's been some studies that have shown that actually as many mistakes are being made by residents and ha residents handing off patients to other residents who are coming on. And oh, so it's another way of miscommunication. Right. And so I think there's no perfect system, but you know, I think that uh, we still have to try and strive mm -hmm. to, to provide better care for our, for our cool. patients if we can. Just one more question then we'll take out. If you hadn't gone into this field professionally, what would you have done? What would have been something you would have pursued? You know, that's a good question. I, uh, I ask myself that on a daily basis. <laughs> you know, how, how come I couldn't steer into the skid? Well, how did I end up uh, doing what I'm doing? You know, uh, I probably would have followed my dad's footsteps and gone into the military. Military, yeah. Yeah, I was, I was pretty close to going to the Air Force Academy. I had mm -hmm. an appointment uh, to go and um, I had a scholarship to go to Baylor, and I ended up choosing Baylor mm -hmm. instead. And so that, that's probably what I would have done. Right. Yeah. Well, Doctor, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you. We've got some green M&Ms over there. Yeah, for Dr. McGee. That's right. That's right. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Siobhan Palmer with Platforms, a life-lifting news program for women broadcasting from Medical City, Dallas. We'll be back in a moment. <laughs>